Thank you both for being here and for your films. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's a heavy program. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think in some ways, both of these films are a bit of a shift in register for both of your recent work, so I think there's a lot to talk about. Um, maybe we'll start with Tiffany, um, your piece. Um, it was interesting you were saying um, that in some ways the beginning of this piece began last year when we screened your film, Do Not Circulate, and a conversation that you had with your parents after the film. Um, so maybe you could, yeah, we could start there. Um, also, I should say, it's so hard to talk immediately after these films because they put you in quite a state. And so it's really hard to like form words again after that. So just going to caveat that. <laughs> um, so Do Not Circulate uh, deals with uh, an incident in 2019 at, in Prince Edward Station. And uh, I had a conversation with my mom, who's in the audience over there. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, she told me about how Prince Edward has actually been haunted for a long time um, since World War II. And a lot of my work has been dealing with history and how uh, history also gets standardized and naturalized in these sorts of single narratives or a cluster of narratives and these sort of minor histories get kind of washed away. Um, and a lot of these memories are, are from her perspective as a child during that sort of post-war era um, and kind of unsettle these sort of dominant ways of thinking about Hong Kong and that time and and also these places, um, Hong Kong's also, you know, stores a lot of violent history. Um, so anyway, the, the kind of beginning of that came from there and then a kind of many years long fascination with archival footage of Hong Kong, um, taking footage from the 30s up until the late 70s that just is, it's all, it's, it, they're all from travelers, different travelers, all amateur footage and they can't not shoot Hong Kong in the same exact way. Like they're all seeing the same things, it's all sort of like, but I think that is th the trouble also of uh, filming cities that also have a kind of mythic um, presence about them, like Hong Kong, like New York. You can't unsee the cer certain ways to look at them and certainly the touristic gaze is very much a reflection of that um, and it's about trying to like unspool uh, that somehow. Yeah, and your um, recent work has been, as you said, a lot about the contemporary situation in Hong Kong. I mean, you last year you had just come from from living there right before the festival, and um, yeah, this work I think is a shift to a historical um, thinking through Hong Kong in a historical context. But also, um, I felt that your mode of working really changed. Um, the last works, there was um, a lot of voiceover over the images. And this work is much literally quieter in terms of having the text come um, visually. And so, yeah, I just wondered if you could speak about kind of the, the shift in style. I think I always do that between works. Salty, wet, too salty, too wet. Never rest on rest, do not circulate. I'm always trying to kind of hide from myself a little bit and trying to do the sort of opposite. Once I get tired of one mode or I exhaust it and I and then I and I crave and then I d like crave something else. So I think it kind of begins there. But yeah, I had just moved back. I also, you know, when you're submitting to festivals, you have to say where this film is from and it's from the United States. That's what I say. Because it's also I'm making it here. There's also the trouble of calling it a film from Hong Kong when making a film in Hong Kong right now is so challenging, especially a political film. Um, and this one deals specifically with memory and historical memory and, um, uh, yeah. Will you say more about the process of researching the images and um, kind of working with the archival footage? Uh, my editor, Shore Deek, is in the audience somewhere. Yay. Um, <coughs> I had been using that, or I'd been just kind of obsessed with that 
um, you know, one of these like YouTube like deep dives that I constantly tap <laughs> and thinking also about like um, who owns that archival footage. Like there are so many indignant faces like looking back at you um, and uh, and finding them in like the corner of the frame often because the people who are shooting are not so aware of these sorts of like uh, they're obviously not uncomfortable shooting people who don't want to be <laughs> on camera. Um, and uh, and so it was looking for these little bits that kind of unsettle the frame a little bit and um, unsettle this kind of dominant pattern of seeing things. And yeah, your other works you edited, but this one you worked collaboratively. Can you say a bit about the shift in what it meant to kind of work, bring someone else into that process? Um, I think it's also a little precursor into a longer film, and then also starting a new book about, uh, like this is through the sort of lens of my mom from childhood and thinking about, and, and remembering Hong Kong, but sort of encountering an adult world as a child, which I think is really interesting and something that I've been thinking about of memories as a child of watching television and television being this like portal into this like adult world. And uh, so that's like the beginnings of my new book. And then also like as I write, I'm whatever happens in that process like usually shows me the way for making a new film. So um, working with Short is it's like, it's like a sort of um, ramping up to something, yeah. Um, let's move to you, Ben. Um, Against Time is a lot more personal than I think a lot of your work in recent years. And, um, you know, these the themes of mortality, of life and death are super palpable. And um, your family is in this film. Um, our dear friend, Jonathan Schwartz, a late filmmaker is also in this film. Um, yeah, can you just tell us about kind of your headspace going into making the work? Yeah, I think it wasn't um, it wasn't like headspace. It was like heart body space. body heart space. Yeah. I mean, I really um, I guess it started because I had made this feature film called The Invisible Mountain which is showing on Saturday at the Museum of Mo Moving Image. Um, but where I had traveled from Finland to um, Greece with this fellow who was, we were looking for a thing that didn't exist, and we went through Belarus on, we were there on Independence Day, and this was in 2019, and filmed these fireworks and filmed a few other things there, and then a year later, uh, the protests in Belarus happened around the same time and the, the sense of that space had changed so much that it really, and of course it's changed even further, that it became a staging ground for Russian troops coming into Ukraine. And I was just really in the throes of the pandemic feeling like, um, yeah, like time was a thing that it would be really nice to like, Re reverse or m move against or just shift the direction of and I was thinking about my friend Jonathan our friend Jonathan who died four years ago today in fact and uh, and the way that he thought about fireworks and the way that he thought about especially a kind of poetics of images of bringing images together to produce this third this like feeling that that exists and happens and so yeah just in some sense, the first, the blue section of that film was like a found footage film, but it was really me trying to figure out a set of feelings that could, that had some kind of body of movement to them. And then that led into this red section, which in a way is the same feeling, but a lot redder. And um, again, thinking about like how, how to use, I think because I couldn't travel and I couldn't film groups of people, um, like most of us, all of us. And I was living in a new place in Marseille and had this beautiful kid. 
but also like it's hard having a kid <laughs> and having a partner. So there was a lot of stuff that was that felt fraught, and I I was just really trying to figure out how to like find a way through it, I guess. And it's probably the first time that I've yeah ha not had another subject that was clearly in front of me, and so the subject was me, or it was time, or it was this certain space that I was existing in. Um, and I want to speak about the strobe effect. Mm. For me, um, the, the kind of pulsing back and forth of images is like this kind of life death thing that it, you feel in your body you know it's like a rhythm that is very visceral and um yeah it's you feel your body I mean I don't know how else to say it it just makes you so aware of you know your body and being alive <laughs> and yeah. what all that means um and so yeah that's my experience of it but I'm just curious why for you that was such an important formal um, component of the work? Well, I, th I, I mean, cinema for me has always been about having slash being a body and the possibilities of really like animating that corporeality in a somewhat like static position of engagement. And I think, yeah, that the strobe, I mean, I can say that filmmaking is, al is also often like what's exciting about it is for me is trying is having problems that I just can't like get around like having a really beautiful image of a baby I mean like how am I going to use a baby <laughs> in a film like I, like I'm not the kind of filmmaker who puts babies in my films <laughs> or like flamingos I was saying this before like there are certain images that I just I had no idea like how what to do with them because I didn't want the baby to cut into something else because then it's just too it's this this thing becomes that thing and what is also really clearly exciting about cinema is that it, you can produce time and there was this possibility of making these things actually happen simultaneously like multiple times happening simultaneously and that in conjunction with the possibility of having being a body and this sound that's like hard stereo panning back and forth that really, yeah, just lets time kind of evaporate for a little while. Um, I think those were all things that I was uh, maybe more concretely now trying to get at, but in the process, not really sure, but became excited about these things as they happened. You mentioned the baby face, but I mm. wanted to ask you specifically about that sequence in the tunnel. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I. Th yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was like, can I? This is, I was like, 2001, can I do it? Like, can I do a long <laughs> crossfade of a baby's face over a tunnel? Is it possible? And I was like, yeah, it's great. <laughs> you know, like, it really, I was like, wow, this really. This really, I think it's also the thing that's lovely about like recording images and then having them just like getting enough, trying to produce enough distance from them that you can let them do the thing that they want to do. Mm -hmm. And it really felt like that slow crossfade. I was thinking a lot about Kelly Reichardt's Meeks cutoff with all those like incredible crossfades that she has. And I think I've wanted to do a long crossfade for a long time. And uh, it just made sense in terms of, I mean, they're like, none of these were really clear ideas that it feels like they all happened at the same time. I was also doing a lot of, because there was more time in the pandemic, I was also trying to play more modular synthesizer just to get better at it. And I had been doing this, this particular sound for a little while when I sort of at the same time understood the strobe strategy and understood this like the pulse of those lights in the tunnel and everything just kind of like happened simultaneously I think I'm not sure but I think so um yeah and that the baby tunnel is, is just like whoo like it really works and it was really exciting to see that it works um yeah mm. 
let's open up to questions. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll just, um, I had also, I had made, um, with this movie, The Invisible Mountain, its first iteration was a three channel, was a six channel projection, and three of the channels were 70 minute loops that were happening at the same time, and they only shared about five minutes of the same material. So it meant that when I was editing, I had these three timelines that I was looking at. And I realized when I started doing this uh, str triple, like three frame oscillation that I was essentially doing the same thing. I was thinking about these three different times happening simultaneously and just cutting out bits and pieces. Um, yeah, so one part of my practice had opened my brain up to, to apply it to some other part. And I, I, yeah, I think that was, that was it. I, just, I had a bunch of footage, which I, don't, which I had been accumulating without really knowing what it was. And then when I approached it and asked it what it wanted to be, this is what it said. Um, and uh, I guess it was just a matter of sort of collecting all the footage and uh, looking for it and trying to find uh, recurring themes and sort of weaving them together. Um, and the feet and the landscapes and the crossing the streets, basically all this kind of like misusing archival footage essentially. <laughs> uh, and that was the sort of editing process was trying to like kind of bucket all of the cliches that I was seeing across the way that this city was shot. Um, and then pulling them together and creating some of those tensions uh, as you see them juxtaposed between like, and skipping in time between like one era to another era. And you can see also the kind of degradation of the images too, because I'm pulling in so tight that like the image you could just see so much pixelation happen. And that is just part of me ripping this footage from online and in the public domain and these things. So um, it's also kind of liking the patina of circulation that degrades the image um, and working with rather than against it. Any other questions? No. <laughs> do we ha do you have questions for each other? <laughs> uh, I mean, I was really excited about the sound of that f of your film, like the <laughs> and how. What did you think it was? I <laughs> um, I'm curious. I wasn't trying to figure out its source because I felt like it was it it wanted to be like a texture that could become a lot of other things and depending on the images that were happening it kind of changed its character as as the film progressed or like what I understood it relationally sometimes it was water sometimes it was like city drones sometimes it, you know like it really moved around which I think is a really uh, yeah like a very sensitive use of of drone to or repetition to be able to get it to become other things. Um, yeah, I, it came to me. There's like a something about our films also that's like hi hyper personal, <laughs> and uh, the way in which we sublimate it, <laughs> and the many tactics tactics of sublimating it. And what you're talking about with sound is interesting because I actually originally had um, I had my mom as a voiceover. And then, uh, but actually, you know, she's talking to me, so sh it's a qu quite a s sweet voice. And what she's saying is not sweet. <laughs> it's quite a dark history. Mm -hmm. um, but it's trying to, so then I sort of ex pulled that back, and so then it, it's just a sort of silent film. Mm -hmm. But from the voiceover, we had um, the air conditioning on, mm -hmm. and there's this whir of the air conditioning, and I, I've been thinking a lot about, um, the presence of air conditioning in cinemas and the sound of air conditioning in cinemas, especially when you're watching a film and then suddenly you hear it kick, uh, kick on 
but also like the um, like Jean Ma, her essay on sleeping in the cinema. I've been thinking ab about that a lot. But really, what enables sleeping in the cinema is this kind of like climate-controlled, really cool environment and dark, and especially in subtropical places like Hong Kong or or India, where you know some of these like uh, important cinemas have come out of. Air conditioning is a huge has a huge role yeah. yeah in that so I, I anyway that was the sort of background of thinking about okay I'm not going to use air conditioning as a sound but what also sounds like air conditioning so that's actually cicadas mm -hmm. um, and it's cicadas and uh, um, uh, like a like a some maybe you can hear like a bus passing also yeah. but I like that it's sort of non-specific Cicadas on a bus, was it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but again, uh, going back to the sort of sublimating the personal, and but also like not being able to not, you can't not face the personal also in the work as it comes up as you're working through it, um, but also wanting to protect the subjects too in some ways. I, I, I was sensing this kind of threading between yeah. the, yeah. Yeah, like maybe going hard in the strobe is also a way to just be like, <laughs> yeah, like keep your distance a little bit from, but me as well to keep my distance from the stuff. I mean, my partner's in there, my kids in there, my city city friends, all of these things that I imagined. Like I don't the 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 relationship or the significance isn't spelled out. But I always assume that stuff is felt in the way that when I've made other films, I assume that the proximity of camera to subject proposes a relationship between subject and author, and that there's some other kind of, that, that people, an audience sees, feels that. They may not, like, they may not know it, but they understand it, and I think that was, yeah, I mean, there is there is a real sweetness to your mother's voice, even though it's not present, and that there is, that there is a real sweetness to your mother's voice. <laughs> even though it's not present. Like you can, the way that it's written and how it's sort of, yeah, is, is there, is really like, we're with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Do we have time for one more question or no? No. Well, I think that was a great place to end. Yeah. So thank you both so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.